Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we are diving into the insights offered by the celebrated author and management consultant, Peter Drucker, in his seminal work, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. This is a compelling exploration of how innovative thinking and strategies can not only create new customers for your enterprise, but also catalyze its growth in unexpected ways. In this book, Drucker demystifies entrepreneurship, demonstrating how it can be learned and employed by anyone with a vision to achieve. Moreover, he posits that entrepreneurial skills are not just relevant for new ventures, but can reinvigorate and revolutionize established corporations as well. Penned by Drucker, who holds an astounding legacy as one of the top thinkers in business management and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2002, this work is steeped in wisdom and experiences that span decades. This episode of 20 Minute Books would hold particular value for entrepreneurs. Anyone harboring an interest in entrepreneurship, senior managers in large companies, or simply anyone who has a great idea for a new product or service. So, join us as we unravel the power of innovation and entrepreneurship by Peter Drucker in just 20 minutes. Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Discover how anybody in any job can be an entrepreneur. Introduction. Are you in? Discover the road to entrepreneurship. Despite popular misconceptions, becoming an entrepreneur is not an exclusive club reserved for the unique entrepreneur types. Rather, it's an accessible journey that any aspirant can undertake. The trick lies in understanding the right tactics and embracing the very essence of entrepreneurial success, innovation. Remember, innovation is not strictly about inventing something new. It's also about rethinking the way you approach tasks. Immerse yourself in this book and you will discover how to identify innovative strategies and the best places to look for them, how IBM cleverly turned their competitor's idea into their profit-making venture, why constructing business strategies mirrors the intricate process of launching a moonbound rocket. Part 1. A Treasure Hunt. Identifying your sources of innovation. What's the secret source to entrepreneurial success? While many might argue that it's either luck or sheer hard work, the true answer lies in constantly seeking out innovation catalysts. In other words, events or circumstances that fuel the drive for innovation. These catalysts can be sourced internally, within your business's surroundings, the market sphere, or the industry, or externally, spanning fields like politics, academia, or science. Let's delve into the internal sources of innovation. An unexpected event or development often serves as the first internal source of innovation. Take Macy's, New York's largest department store, as an example. They suddenly witnessed an inexplicable surge in the sales of appliances. It wasn't something they had planned or predicted, it just happened. When such unexpected events occur, astute businesses or entrepreneurs know how to turn them to their advantage. Unfortunately, Macy's failed to capitalize on this opportunity. Rather than harnessing the unexpected windfall, they attempted to suppress appliance sales, dismissing it as an abnormality. The consequence? A significant loss of their market share. Contrarily, department stores like Bloomingdale's, that faced a similar situation, decided to leverage the trend. They invested heavily in marketing their appliance sections, eventually boosting their profits. Next up, another key internal source of innovation springs from the evolution and transformations within an industry or market. Case in point, the 1960s witnessed a seismic shift in the automobile industry. What was once a market primarily driven by local players swiftly evolved into a realm ruled by international giants. Companies like Volvo astutely seized this change, aggressively branding themselves on a global scale. The result was transformative. Volvo morphed from a struggling small manufacturer to a global success story. However, companies like Citroën that failed to adapt to the market transformation found themselves losing out. 
So by skillfully turning unexpected events to your advantage and keeping pace with evolving markets, you stand to gain tremendously. Part 2. Spotting Imperfections and Misconceptions The Road to Innovation We've already explored two internal innovation catalysts. Let's now examine two more, process need and incongruities. The concept of process need is rooted in identifying weaknesses within a given process, as these weak links present ripe opportunities for innovation. Consider the case of eye surgeries in the 1950s, where cataract removal was a common operation. Despite near-perfect procedures, there was one pesky step, the cutting of a ligament, which occasionally resulted in bleeding and potential eye damage. Here's where William Connor, a pharmaceutical salesman, stepped in. Spotting this weak link, he devised a solution an enzyme that could dissolve the ligament without the need to sever it, plus a method for long-term storage of this enzyme. Not only did Connor's innovation become a standard procedure in cataract removal, but it also allowed him to sell his company for a generous sum. Moving on, the second internal source of innovation deals with incongruities, or the discrepancies between the actual scenario and one's interpretation of it. Whenever there's a gap, there lies an opportunity to innovate. A classic example of this comes from the shipping industry prior to the 1950s. Shipping companies were hell-bent on increasing their ship's speeds to swiftly transit between ports, yet they overlooked an alarming rise in shipping costs. The root cause of their struggle wasn't the speed between ports, but rather the idle time that ships spent docked at ports, a classic case of incongruity between the perceived issue and the actual problem. The innovative solution arrived in the form of the container ship, capable of being loaded and unloaded at a rapid pace. This significant reduction in port, dwell time, slashed shipping cost by a whopping 60%. Part 3. Nurturing innovation from the world beyond. External industry sources. Not all sparks of innovation are birthed within the confines of an industry, market, or company. Some are seeded in the external realm, from socio-political landscapes to academic arenas. Let's dive into these external sources of innovation. One external springboard of innovation is demographic understanding. Any shift in the population's composition, like its size or age, can potentially alter market demands. After all, Different demographics seek different products and services. Those who can foresee these changes and adapt accordingly often have a better shot at success. Take the baby boom phenomenon in America following the Second World War, for instance. Sensing an opportunity amidst a sharp surge in birth rates, Melville, a shoe retailer, began targeting the teenage shoe and clothing market in the early 1960s, right when these boomers were stepping into adolescence. The result? a highly successful strategy. Moving on, another external catalyst for innovation is knowledge-based innovation. This refers to the birth of a new idea or invention. Typically, what comes to mind when we think of innovation? However, harnessing knowledge to generate a successful innovation usually involves an extensive process, demanding a myriad of expertise. The computer serves as a perfect illustration of this. It's the culmination of centuries of progress in mathematics, electronics, and programming. The journey towards creating the computer kicked off in the 17th century with the advent of a binary number system. Fast forward to the early 19th century, and we see the birth of a system capable of crafting a simple calculating machine. By 1880, a way to program instructions into a machine had been conceived. Despite these leaps, it wasn't until 1946 that the first operational computer came to life. While it's evident that not all inventions require centuries of development, it's clear that knowledge-based innovation can indeed be a lengthy process. Part 4. Innovation isn't just for startups. How big businesses can foster entrepreneurship. Contrary to popular belief, Innovation isn't a domain exclusive to agile startups or zealous entrepreneurs. Even sizable businesses can harness the power of innovation 
provided they take certain measures. Firstly, cultivating innovation requires an environment conducive to its growth, born from standardized policies. Businesses need to consistently ask themselves, how can we become an organization that embraces and craves innovation? Responding to this question involves adopting policies that encourage the readiness to discard obsolete practices and actively seek innovative shifts. It's crucial to acknowledge that every product, service, and technology has an expiration date, signifying the need to continually explore alternatives. Moreover, a roadmap anticipating when innovations might be required can help businesses capitalize on these opportunities. Secondly, businesses must design an organizational structure that promotes and rewards entrepreneurship. Novel, innovative projects should exist separately from the old, with their own dedicated space and a high-level manager steering the ship. Furthermore, the presence of an internal assessment system can help enhance the company's entrepreneurial performance. After all, it's critical to measure if the outcomes match the initial expectations. For instance, a leading bank developed a feedback mechanism that offered insights into the potential results from new ventures. This system allowed them to predict when these ventures should start yielding returns. Finally, regular evaluations of all innovation endeavors can keep businesses on the path to continuous improvement. Take, for example, one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies. Their annual reviews of new drug developments help decide whether to push forward or pull the plug on projects. By following these steps, businesses, regardless of their size, can transform into entrepreneurial organizations, fostering a culture of innovation. Part 5. Charting the Course for Success. The Blueprint for New Enterprises. Every fledgling enterprise needs a well-charted roadmap, a plan that outlines the course for the present and points towards the right future direction. But how can one build an effective business? The answer lies in these four crucial steps. Step one, market discovery is the key. Surprisingly, many entrepreneurs find success in a market entirely different from what they initially envisioned. Hence, for any new enterprise, it's essential to keep an eye on diverse markets. Let's take a small Indian company as an example. They purchased a license for a European-designed bicycle fitted with a small engine, thinking it would be perfect for the Indian market. However, the bicycle found no takers. Instead, the small engine became a hit, as it proved ideal for irrigation pumps. The company owner capitalized on this unexpected market, reaping substantial profits. Step two, financial focus should not be overlooked. Building a new business isn't just about maximizing profits, it's equally important to ensure the availability of funds for investment, growth, and weathering any storms that might come the company's way. A reliable guideline is to have a clear understanding of the cash required 12 months ahead, along with its intended uses. The final two steps involve assembling a top-notch management team promptly and defining the role of the founding entrepreneur. The founder must begin assembling a management team before the business grows too large for one person to steer effectively. Once the team is in place, the founding entrepreneurs need to ask themselves two pivotal questions. What are my strengths and how can I best contribute to the company's growth? It's crucial to understand that if the founder can no longer bring value to the table, it might be best for the company if they step aside. Part six, first mover advantage. The significant perks of being an industry pioneer. Entering a new market as an entrepreneur is a strategic endeavor, aiming to secure a significant market share. To increase the odds of success, an entrepreneur needs to adopt an effective strategy. One such strategy is to be the fastest with the mostest, aiming to be the trailblazer in the industry and reaping the benefits that come with it. Launching into the market first requires a full throttle effort. Remember, the chance to be the inaugural player in the field comes only once, and it demands an all out pursuit. Take Hoffman Laroche in the 1920s, for instance. At the time, it was just a small chemical firm producing dyes in a fiercely competitive market. However, 
it took a bold gamble on a new relatively unexplored domain, vitamins. Despite the discovery of vitamins being recent and sparking little interest among competitors, Hoffman Laroche seized the opportunity. They acquired patents, hired the discoverers with lucrative salaries, and invested heavily, even taking on substantial debt, to produce and market these vitamins. Their risk was handsomely rewarded. The company was the first to reach the vitamin market, securing a position of global leadership that lasted for six decades. However, this strategy carries considerable risk. If you miss your mark, there's no second chance. Moreover, failing to secure the first mover position could result in losing a dominant market spot. Therefore, thorough understanding of the market, coupled with the accurate assessment of viable opportunities, is crucial to securing the top spot. It's akin to aiming a rocket at the moon. Everything needs to be meticulously calculated and measured from the start. Even the slightest miscalculation could mean missing the moon entirely. Part 7. Spotting Unseen Opportunities. Success lies in the gaps competitors overlook. Another potent entrepreneurial strategy revolves around identifying the ignored crevices in the market, those areas your competition has overlooked. This approach is aptly termed the hit them where they ain't strategy. It can be pursued via two key tactics, creative imitation and entrepreneurial judo. Creative imitation involves replicating an existing idea, but revamping its application to make it more enticing to customers. In the 1940s, for instance, IBM constructed the world's first computer. However, they soon abandoned their creation lured by a competitor's version that sparked their interest. The competitor was ENIAC, whose computer IBM believed to be ideal for business tasks like managing payrolls, a potential that ENIAC hadn't recognized. So, IBM decided to mimic ENIAC's computer, outfitting it with additional features that businesses would find appealing. Their strategy paid off handsomely. IBM's version not only became a massive hit, but it also set the standard for future computer models. Entrepreneurial judo, on the other hand, involves strategically targeting your competitors' weak spots. A common weak spot among established companies is arrogance, the belief that their methods are superior, leading them to dismiss fresh ideas. For the astute competitor, this can be an exploitable opportunity. In the 1970s, for example, a small US-based company invented the transistor. The dominant American firms dismissed it, not because it lacked merit, but simply because it didn't originate from one of their own. It wasn't deemed important enough. But one less known company did see the potential. The company was Sony, and it seized the opportunity, paying a mere $25,000 for the transistor. Sony then used this new technology to design the world's first portable transistor radio, capturing the U.S. market within a few years, thanks to the arrogance of its larger rivals. Part 8. Finding Your Place. Success Through Carving Out a Unique Niche. Often, an entrepreneur's success lies in focusing on a unique, specialized segment of the market. The author refers to this strategy as establishing ecological niches, and there are multiple ways to uncover them. One such method is the tollgate strategy where you claim market dominance by creating a product or service that's an essential component of another product or service. Consider William Connor's enzyme, a vital element in cataract removal procedures. The beauty of this strategy is that your product remains on top, as it's often not worthwhile for competitors to contest it. In Connor's case, his enzyme is essential for the surgery, but its cost pales in comparison to the total operation cost. As a result, demand for a cheaper alternative is relatively low. Plus, the market for this enzyme isn't very large, so a cheaper version would likely not be profitable. Thus, Connor's company holds a secure position. However, this strategy isn't without risks. Its success hinges on the necessity of the other product. If a new medication that eliminates the need for eye surgery were discovered, Connor's business would likely go under. Another niche finding strategy involves identifying specialty skill and specialty market niches. These strategies are quite alike. 
They entail accumulating knowledge or skills that others lack, whether it's a unique skill set or specialized knowledge of a market. In the early days of the automotive industry, manufacturing companies had expert mechanics but lacked knowledge about the electronics required in each car. This gap allowed electronics firms possessing the required skills to profit substantially. Yet a potential pitfall looms, the risk that your unique skill could eventually become commonplace and with it, your niche could disappear. Part nine, sparking a fresh demand, success by innovating around established products. In this final strategy, the innovation is not a product or service, but the very strategy itself. The idea is to take a well-established product and ignite a new wave of customer demand for it. Let's delve into two approaches of executing this strategy. One way is to foster customer utility, that is, taking an existing product and enhancing it to further meet a customer's needs. The core product doesn't change. Instead, the focus shifts to aligning it more with the customer's desires. Take the example of Lennox China Company and their sets of Good China, a favored gift for many American brides. A complete set was quite expensive as a gift, and buying individual pieces was a confusing task for guests. The Lennox China Company came up with an ingenious solution. They modified the bridal registry system. The bride would pick out a pattern from the company's collection in advance, and then the guests could choose individual pieces from that selection. In doing so, the company fulfilled customer demand without changing the product itself. Another way to breathe new life into an existing product is through a pricing strategy. Instead of focusing on the cost of production, this approach zeroes in on what customers are willing to pay. When Gillette safety razors hit the market, they were priced higher than a professional shave at a barber. Recognizing that customers were reluctant to pay more for a home shave, Gillette decided to sell their razors at a loss. However, they ensured that their razors were compatible only with Gillette blades, which were sold at a profit. As a result, they recovered their losses. Over time, their pricing strategy proved to be profitable. Final summary. The central theme of this book, to be a successful entrepreneur, it's essential to tap into the vital sources of innovation. Identifying these sources can give you the competitive edge you need to outpace your rivals. Above all, a successful entrepreneur puts the focus on the customer, not the product. This requires recognizing a market and ensuring that your products or services fulfill its specific demands. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then. Happy reading and happy listening.